All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the latest edition of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A research study is designed to evaluate the long-term effects of a new exercise program on participants' health. The study starts with 100 participants, but by the end of the 12-month period, only 60 participants remain due to some dropping out for personal reasons, moving away, or losing interest. The loss of these participants could affect the study's results. What is this type of threat to the study's internal validity called? Wordy question. It's okay. We are going to read carefully and understand what the question is asking before looking at our answer choices. The question is about internal validity and what can threaten internal validity. Internal validity, of course, means our manipulations, our variables are controlling the behavior change and nothing else. In this case, if we have a research study with 100 participants and over the course of 12 months, 40 of those participants leave, because of personal reasons or moving away or losing interest, this could affect the results because we're now down to 60 participants instead of the original 100, which was maybe what the research study was designed for. So what do we call it and what is the threat when we have participants who are dropping out for one reason or another? A, history. History has to do with more or less the learning history of our participants. So if they are receiving outside help on exercise, or they've done exercise programs in the past, whatever their history is with these programs or programs that we're not controlling, that would be their history. What about maturation? Maturation is just the natural growth, the natural growth or evolution of a participant over time. Maturation happens to everyone. Maturation is especially potent usually in younger children who are developing at a high, quick rate. And so you want to be very aware, especially over 12 months, of just the natural growth and progression of our participants. In this case, though, we're not worried about that. What about C, instrumentation? Instrumentation has to do with how we're measuring or collecting data on our participants. Again, now what the question is asking about, the question is asking about participants who are dropping out, and when we are talking about losing participants for one reason or another, we are talking about attrition. So by after 12 months, we've lost 40 participants due to D, attrition, and this is a threat to internal validity. A therapist has been implementing a behavior intervention plan to reduce aggressive outbursts in a client. Over time, the therapist starts making small changes to the intervention, such as reinforcing slightly different behaviors or using different prompts than initially outlined in the plan. These changes occur gradually and without formal documentation. After a few weeks, the client's progress slows down. What has likely occurred? All right, question wants to know what's changed. Why is this client's progress slowing down? What's a possible, possible explanation? Well, what do we know so far? We know a therapist is implementing a plan to reduce outburst, but the therapist is making these changes to the intervention. They're reinforcing different behaviors, using different prompts, and they're just changing smaller and more and more things about the initial plan that they really shouldn't be doing and not documenting them as well. So intentional or not, they're occurring gradually, and slowly but surely, what is happening, the therapist is drifting away from the original treatment. And so what will we call that? Well, we would call that a treatment drift. Treatment drift occurs when the original plan starts to change just gradually over time. This is going to happen with almost every plan. That's why we need to supervise and train or on a regular basis to prevent these small but gradual changes that just tend to occur. Treatment integrity. Now, treatment drift affects treatment integrity, but treatment integrity is not occurring here. If anything, we're lacking treatment integrity. Observer drift has to do with measurement. 
It's similar to treatment drift because with observer drift, the way we're measuring something is changing when it shouldn't be. And then the reactivity. Reactivity, of course, is when the person of interest is being observed. They're reacting to the observer and changing their behavior. Not what's happening here because it doesn't appear or we don't talk about the therapist being supervised or observed. All we are talking about is how this therapist over time is making these small, subtle changes to the intervention. And as a result, treatment drift is occurring. A delivery driver drives a truck each day and drops packages off at the front door of people's homes. The driver must first load up his truck at the shipping and receiving hub. The driver must then make each delivery. Finally, the driver must return the truck to the shipping and receiving hub. Once he has done this, he is allowed to go home for the day. If going home is reinforcement, what type of schedule is represented here? So we've got a compound schedule question, and this is a pretty straightforward compound schedule because clearly, what is the delivery driver needing to do? He has to complete this chain. He first loads up his truck, which then signals the start of the next piece of the chain, which is make each delivery, which signals the next piece, which is return the truck to shipping and receiving. Once he's done that, he gets his reinforcement, which is going home for the day. A very, very simple, very straightforward chain question. What are multiple and mixed schedules? Because remember, we always read all of our answer choice, choices so we can understand why they're wrong. Multiple and mixed schedules are when we have one or more basic schedule that are randomly rotating or going back and forth. So the schedules are not occurring at the same time. Concurrent schedules has to do with choice where we have two different schedules for two different behaviors and there's more choice involved. Of course, here our schedule is chained because each of the simple schedules leads into the next simple schedule, making a compound schedule where each schedule must complete be completed in a certain order in order to earn that reinforcement. Bruce decides to go to the coffee shop this morning to complete some of his work. Bruce goes to the coffee shop and orders an Americano and the overnight oats. Bruce pays for his item, sits down, and gets out his laptop and headphones. Bruce then starts working. From both a radical and methodological point of view, ordering the food is considered what? Don't overthink this question. It's written in a strange way, but it's very straightforward. You just need to know the difference between radical and methodological behaviorism. We deal in radical behaviorism where public and private events are both considered behaviors and they should be analyzed as such. So in this case, if the behavior of interest is ordering food and we want to know both radical and methodological points of view, view food how? View the act of ordering food how? Because if Bruce goes to the coffee shop and he orders his food, what would that be considered? Would that be considered A, a public event? Well, is it observable for Bruce to buy and order his food? It is. In radical and methodological point of views, both view this as a quote-unquote public event. What it isn't is a private event. A private event is unobservable to those around us. Now, would Bruce ordering food be part of the analysis of behavior in a radical point of view? 100%. What about a methodological point of view? 100%. Methodolog methodological point of views just do not include private events in the analysis. But in this case, Bruce ordering food is a public event and therefore would be part of the analysis of behavior. So ordering the food is both considered a public event and part of our analysis of behavior. So the answer here is D, both A and C. Which of the following would not be a defining feature of an echoic according to Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior? All right, verbal behavior question, and we're focused on the echoic, and we're focused on what is not a defining feature, meaning three of these are likely defining features, while one isn't. A, the echoic has point-to-point -point correspondence. Do echoics need to have point-to-point -point correspondence with the evocative verbal stimulus? Of course, that's what an echoic boils down to, copying what was communicated. 
Does the echoic have formal similarity? It should. The echoic should copy again what was communicated. That's the idea behind the echoic. What about C? The echoic can be evoked by a nonverbal stimulus. Is that true? That is not true. The echoic is evoked by a verbal stimulus. A tact is evoked by a nonverbal stimulus. And then D, the echoic is reinforced by a generalized condition reinforcer. Yes, we can reinforce echoics through praise and tokens and other GCRs that can be used in a variety of situations. So what is not a defining feature of an echoic, according to Skinner? That is the echoic cannot, or the echoic can be evoked by a nonverbal stimulus. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Be sure to subscribe for all of our updates, including our upcoming sixth edition content. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.